Hello, welcome everyone to the uh, Perio Lightning Talks. It's uh, Monday, November 20th, uh, 2017. And today we have uh, four presentations from four different projects in that are within the Perio Foundation suite of uh, open source projects. We have uPortal, OpenCast, Zerte, and Open Academic Environment. And my name is Neil Caden. I am the Sakai Community Coordinator, and I work for the Aperio Foundation. And uh, timing will be Wilma Hodges uh, with Long Sight. She's volunteered to time these. And the format Hi, of <laughs> Hi Wilma. Uh, the format of these uh, talks is to do a five-minute presentation, followed by a five-minute uh, Q and A. And we're going to try and keep as close to possible as on time uh, to make it a true lightning talk. So um, we have the order set up here. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the slides for Zerti, who's going first. And what I'll ask for each of the presenters is to, you know, briefly introduce yourself and um, and what you're talking about. And I see there's a little already a little <laughs> squiggle over there. So my best, it worked. Okay. Good. Here, let me give you presenter permission so you can go through your own slides. And when you're ready. Just, uh, just say, you know, just uh, start going and look in the chat window for um, like a two-minute warning and one-minute warning as time winds down for you. So uh, take it away, Inga. Okay, thank you, Neil. Um, hello, everybody. Today I'm going to talk a bit about set online toolkits. Um, in five minutes, I can do a lot, but um, I'm uh, going to tell you a bit about. Uh, the new results page and also our XAPI and LRS um, uh, projects. Uh, I have 10 slides, so I hope I can manage in five uh, minutes, but I'll try. Um, my name is Inge Donkervoort, and I'm not going to tell everything that's on this slide. Uh, you can read this afterwards if you want to. Um, you see a picture of me. Um, it's. I have to admit, it's uh, a few years back, but... Uh, 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 you can, um, uh, when you see me now, I look a bit the same, <laughs> but a bit older. Uh, what is uh, Xeta? Uh, a few years ago, we were on the Aperio uh, conference, and uh, Julia Forsyth made, uh, made a very nice picture of what Xeta is. And she, um, uh, uh, almost everything that uh, we told uh, is in this picture. But I will go through the what set is um, in, a, in a nutshell. Uh, you can create uh, media rich and interactive online learning modules for students, or students can make it themselves uh, to present uh, subjects then uh, you can use it on any device the modules uh, so it's html5 it's highly accessible all the things that we add to the suite is um, checked on accessibility we have uh, different templates to use there is a template uh, with uh, 64 uh, 46 uh, different page types you can choose from multiple choice drag and drop um, fill in the gap that kind of things but there's also another template where you can create small websites and then you can use the, the template with the page types to add to that. And then you have a collection of uh, small modules, uh, what you could call a course. And then is there also the decision tree template? Uh, you can create modules with different different teams. There are a few default teams in uh, the set of suite uh, as it is, but you can also create your own theme. So it would look like your own house um, uh, corporate uh, style. And uh, a very nice feature of Xeta is that you can collaborate and work together on the modules. But what I'm going to talk uh, about today is that it's um, when you created it, it's very easy to use on your own website, learning management system, or even offline. As I said, there are different themes. Um, and here, this is not a learning object, so I can't uh, click through it. But uh, when you, on the end of the presentation, you have a link to this uh, learning object. And then you can see what, all kind of different um, uh, example modules that others created already. Uh, this is the project we're working on on this moment, and in uh, January there is a new release of Xeta, and then uh, a lot of things will be in. 
for example, uh, the LTI to add things to your uh, LMS, um, and also the X API and the possible connection to the LRS. Uh, we have a few projects on, the mo on this moment that uh, we are creating this whole um, framework. And um, I added this image to show you how, that, how it could work when you have Xeta, uh, that with LTI, you can add it to your LMS. In your LMS, you can have a report if you want the results there, but there's also a dashboard connected to the uh, XAPI. Um, so the, it's much easier to have information about the learning uh, modules that they do uh, than you can at this moment. At this moment, it's um, mostly practicing when you use those mod modules or when you use SCORM, you can add it to your website and have results in your uh, LMS. I'm sorry, not website, but LMS. Um, but with the XAPI and the LTI uh, 2, there are much more possibilities you have. Um, this is the results page that's already in uh, the last release of Xetem. So you can have a, a learning object from, for example, 10 pages with a lot of questions. And then the last page, you can add a results page where you can see all the results from the exercises you did. And everything wears a, a blue dot. It means that below here, I couldn't get it on this image, um, there is more information about it, more detailed information. And the student can send this uh, in a PDF to his teacher. This is when you can't use it, when you can't have the results in your learning um, management system. What we ha also have already is that you can export the modules as SCORM packages and add it to your learning environment, or you can export it as an offline zip and people can use it offline. For example, for areas where internet isn't that um, that isn't that good. But the last uh, and a very exciting um, uh, new things is that we also have you can see it here LTI two and two B connected to Xeta, and you can um, uh, add this information here and use it uh, in your own system. Uh, it is the first steps, so we have to develop it more, but in the next release, uh, this will be in. And uh, if you have any questions, you always can ask us or the, uh, the community. And this is the, uh, the link to the module. I see I make a mistake, there should be an H before it. But if you go to this URL, you can see this whole learning module again and see it in a bit slower tempo. OK, so we, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It went a little bit over time, but we'll just uh, use about uh, you know three minutes or so, a little over three minutes for the questions, so we can kind of keep on track. Uh, one question I see is, is, um, is, is there, the ZERT PDF available? Yeah, I think, uh, Becky, I think you mean this, uh, this learning object, this PDF? You can use this link or uh, I can send you the PDF or Neil can send you the PDF. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. And so there's a question, are there plans for supporting Caliper in addition to XAPI? Yeah, I'm not the technical one, but uh, I heard that they are going to do some things that you can use both XAPI and Caliper. Cool. But how they are going to do it, I don't know, but that's what I heard. Um, so there's a couple people who are interested in whether there's a cloud-hosted Zerte server for folks who don't want to install and host for themselves. Yes, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can ask us or you can ask uh, Ron Mitchell. Uh, we both have servers where we can host uh, Xerte installations. Um, I have a question, which is around the dashboard. Um, or what kind of dashboard are you using? Are you using one of like the uh, open source dashboard or something you develop custom? No, we are. Uh, uh, hopefully, we are going to use the open dashboard from the Aperio Foundation and uh, and also the LRS from the Aperio Foundation. So we we try to use most of the tools that are in uh, Aperio. Okay, any other any other questions?
All right, well, if there are no other questions for now, then we'll move on to the next presentation, which will be for OpenCast. And okay. so let's go ahead. That thank would you. be, thank you very much. And let's see, that's uh, Rudiger Rolf, right? Right. Let me go ahead and bring, oh, let me go ahead and bring up your presentation first, and then I'll transfer the uh, control over to you. Mm -hmm. Let's see, here we go. There we go. Okay. Now, hold on, let me give you the presenter permissions. And so now you should be able to have control yeah. to scroll through I yourself. And anytime you want to get started, then we'll start the timer. Okay, I'm ready, I guess. Okay. So, hello, my name is Rudiger Rolf. I'm working for the University of Osnabrück in Germany. And I'm a developer on the OpenCast uh, video management tool. So, um, and I want to present on the OpenCast annotation tool. It's an add on project that we have for OpenCast. So, it's not within the main core currently. There's some discussion going on if we should include it later. Uh, but at the moment, it's um, yeah a separate tool with a separate purpose, uh, unlike the lecture recording that is the main focus of OpenCast. So um, yeah, the video annotation tool was uh, that's how it looked like, and I go into details later. But it's uh, it was um, designed uh, currently as an additional player to OpenCast, so it does not has have very much in common with the. Uh, a basic idea of um, recording lectures. It's only that if you keep your videos within OpenCast, you can reuse them in this additional player. Its base, uh, its basic idea is to have a collaborative uh, environment uh, that is web-based, so that any user can go to the website and place annotations that are private or public and shared with others. So. Um, we have different types of annotations there. So we have um, free text annotations that you can use for transcriptions, for example. We have structured annotations that allow further analysis of um, the comments your users make. And on all these annotations, you can have a discussion with in more or less unlimited depth. So uh, users can reply on each other and um, um, you get a structured discussion on this. Um, so there's not an analytics component within the uh, annotation tool, but it's um, more used for scientific purposes so that you can export the data to Excel or even better SPSS or other um, statistics tools. Um, so yeah, you have different types of annotations. Uh, we have free text annotations. So um, while you are typing, you can tell the system to pause the video so that you can uh, yeah, create captions or um, describe the scene or whatever is needed within the context of your task that you ask your students or uh, your co-workers to do. And um, additional to this, what is more exciting, I would say, is uh, that we have structured annotations. Um, so. Um, as an administrator, you can create categories. Um, these, uh, so that's uh, roughly the first line here. Um, then you have labels within uh, these categories, and you can even have um, user-defined scales. So one to three in this example, but it can be uh, words or whatever is needed for your context um, that you have here. Uh, categories, again, can be something uh, that the lecturer shares with um, his students so that they f should follow the public categorizations, or you can have um, private runs if you want to have an additional uh, structure for your purposes. And um, with the I symbol, you can hide these annotations in the timeline. So um, the timeline is, uh, yeah, visible, um, helps to make visible what annotations you have at a current time, as expected. You can have several tracks per user, and uh, the user decides on the visibility. Um, you can import and see uh, tracks of other users. You can even use the tracks of other users for the export then as a printed version or um, um, yeah, um, 
uh, for the uh, Excel sheets and so on. Uh, the timeline is zoomable to get more details here. Um, yeah, what are the use cases of the tool? Uh, currently, we see many pedagogical users uh, so that um, teachers are uh, telling their students to look at lessons that they recorded and uh, find out about the structure of the teaching and so on. And uh, the other point, um, so you can use this uh, data, for example, then to compare teaching styles or um, how people behave. The other point is that we that it is used for supervision of psychotherapists, for example, um, so that to give the therapist feedback on what uh, he is doing uh, to improve himself in the future. Um, in the future, for the future development of the tool, uh, it is that the University of Bern, Bern is currently running a fundraiser to improve the usability of the tool and uh, to update libraries uh, that are used in the background and so on. Please contact David, uh, David Graf from the University of uh, Bern if you're interested to participate in this. And now I'm um, yeah, thanking you for your attention and I hope I made it quite in time. Uh, good job, thank you. Um, so, are there any questions? We have about four minutes for questions. I guess your presentation was so clear, nobody has any questions <laughs> in the moment. Yeah, so more time for the others. Um, so there is a question here. What formats can the, the source video be? Um, in a way, any video as open, Opencast already pre-processes the videos if you upload it there. So um, the tool is connected to Opencast and any video uh, that Opencast manages can be used for the video annotation tool. Um, I guess uh, we are currently in, within the Opencast community discussing how um, we can connect better to other Opencast, uh, to other Reperio projects. So I guess, um, especially looking at Xerti, where you currently have, uh, as far as I see, and only an upload options for videos that you host there, it might be a good. Um, way of um, improving each other's projects with um, uh, yeah um, uh, making thirty um, uh, compatible with opencast I would say so that you can use the opencast video libraries uh, over an API or whatever to include videos and there's a comment there from Greg I guess uh, um, about uh, OpenCast uses FFmpeg for processing in the back end. If FFmpeg can handle it, you can handle it. And several export options. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. If there are no more questions, then we'll uh, thank you for the presentation. We'll go on to the next uh, presentation which is uPortal. So let me go ahead and take presenter permissions back and up here and uh, bring up uPortal and hand the reins over to Jim Hellick. Let's see, here we go. All right, Jim, whenever you wanna get started, we'll start the uh, timer. Great, thanks, Neil. So I'm Jim Helwig uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I've been part of the uPortal community for 15 years. And um, for quite a few years now, I've served as the uPortal Steering Committee Chair. And so I will be talking today about the various ways members of the uPortal community can engage with the project. And when I use the term members, I include anyone with an interest in uPortal. This may primarily be individuals that are responsible for deploying uPortal, but it could also more broadly include those considering adopting uPortal or that are just uh, curious about the project. I am purposefully not limiting this to those that contribute code to the project. 
And while I'm focusing on uPortal, I think these reflections can more generally apply to other open source projects. And as I believe we can learn from each other, I'm interested in hearing uh, what may be working well in other projects. The critical takeaway that I want to leave you with is that everyone can engage with the project. And I mean everyone. There are many levels of engagement. I'll start with some of the easiest and work my way up to those requiring more focused effort. And perhaps one can think of these as levels. Once you have tackled the level, you can think about working to achieve the next level. The easiest way to engage is simply by observ observing. And that could be reading email lists or news posts, documentation, attending webinars, uh, et cetera. Admittedly, the project could do a better job of keeping all these materials, materials um, uh, current and attractive and interesting, but hopefully uh, the materials that are out there uh, will invite you to take the next step and actually try out uPortal. So wouldn't it be nice if you could just easily try out uPortal online? Uh, perhaps self-register in a demo instance and give it a spin? Well, we've actually tried this in the past, but for us, it took uh, quite a fair number of resources to maintain it over time, and we have since discommissioned our online, uh, decommissioned our online demo. But that said, uh, we are getting much better at making it easy for first-time users to just download your portal locally and try it out on uh, their desktop and get a feel for how it works. Maybe someday in the future we'll be able to have something online uh, again. After giving it a look, ideally you want to deploy it at your institution. Uh, but so far, you know, these the what I've been talking about are really one-way levels of engagement. And what I'm particularly interested in is encouraging individuals to contribute back to the project. So how can you do that? Well, one of the easiest ways is to uh, just ask questions on the mailing list. Uh, asking thoughtful questions has a number of benefits to the community. It demonstrates active interest, increases the energy in the mailing lists. It invites others to answer questions, which is perhaps the next level of engagement and not just asking, but answering. And it creates a searchable archive of that question and answer for others to find. Uh, the email discussion lists are also great places to share updates on how your institution is using uPortal. And that can provide ideas or inspire others to on the list to make changes to their um, local deployments. The lists are also good for sharing ideas about where you would like to see uPortal go and help influence the product roadmap. Another way to contribute is through sharing your successes or case studies in perhaps a blog post or a newsletter article. And again, these can inspire others. Um, while you can certainly discuss bugs or issues you've discovered on mailing lists, it's particularly helpful if you report them by creating an issue in our JIRA or GitHub issue trackers. It greatly increases the chance that someone else is going to work on resolving that. You can take a pre give a presentation um, as a way to contribute. And there's many opportunities for these, including the annual Imperial Conference, uPortal community calls, ad hoc webinars, or in-person meetups like the uPortal Developer Days that we're going to be having at the Madison campus here in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're also looking at encouraging people to produce short videos um, of presentations that can be shared. And since you can edit and re-record on your own schedule, that might be less threatening to uh, produce. You can also update uh, documentation as a way of kind of contributing back. As you put more of our documentation in GitHub, it makes it easier for us to maintain it. And if you see an area that's lacking or something that's correct, or even just a simple typo, you can go ahead and use the embedded online editor at GitHub to submit um, an update. And uh, as an incentive, you if you make four submissions, even of these documentation updates in the month of October, you know you could get that Hacktober Fest t-shirt from the folks at DigitalOcean. And of course, we love having pull requests for bug fixes, enhancements, or new features. If you've done something valuable for your own institution, it is generally best in the long run to get that feature back into the core uPortal project. 
Not only does it benefit you in the long run, but it benefits other campuses that can use the same feature. But we also uh, have a few ways you can contribute financially. The first is becoming an Imperial member, and the dues there help uh, support common infrastructure uh, and organizational um, uh, tools that make the greater Aperio community work. It's also possible for individuals to become friends of Aperio, not just uh, organizations. Beyond membership, organizations could become uPortal supporting subscribers, and these funds are targeted to supporting uPortal directly and are managed by the uPortal steering committee. And our current plans are to build up enough subscribers to hire a dedicated uPortal community liaison and release lead. And additionally, one of our commercial affiliates, Unicon, offers an open source support service, and much of the work that they do under that program is contributed back to the main uPortal project. You can also finally uh, look at joining one of the ad hoc or standing committees. The uPortal Steering Committee is going to be having its election soon. The Imperio Conference Planning Committee is ramping up. And uh, there may be an Imperial Web Presence Committee starting. Um, there are also other many uh, meetings or opportunities to join a committee or a discussion on a specific topic like the uPortal Roadmap, future layout management or accessibility or something like that. But thanks for the engaging that folks already do. And I encourage you to look at how you might be able to level up to the next type of engagement. Thank you, Jim. We have uh, two or three minutes for questions. <clears throat> and beyond questions, if there, I, I'll certainly answer questions, but I have a question and that is, um, have folks on the other projects uh, done some other type of uh, uh, way of engaging people in the community to share and uh, contribute? I see um, Inga talks about a Dutch translation. That's one of the things that we're looking at, um, at, at improving is the ability to um, do internationalization within uPortal. And we have some uh, good partners in France that I think are leading uh, some of those uh, efforts. But of course, any internationalization is, is very helpful. And please, please, please read the questions out loud also, which you did, I think, a good job there. So it gets in the recording. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, reiterate Martin's uh, question that I see here um, about a subscription service through UW-Madison. Um, and I think what Martin um, means by that is something we just touched on is um, the idea of a hosted uh, instance of UPortal. Currently, uh, I believe all of the, um, in some way you could look at all the uh, instances of uPortal out there as um, local deployments. But um, we at Madison have, we host it virtually for other campuses in the UW system. Um, we have uh, 13 campuses throughout the UW system. And so we are in a way, providing software as a service to all of those campuses. And uh, we've talked about um, perhaps extending that to other campuses as well. But to any um, commercial affiliates out there, uh, I think that there's an opportunity, especially with uh, some of the latest develop, um, releases of uPortal, uh, there's a commercial opportunity out there as well for someone to look at hosting uPortal for others. So this is Neil. I have a question. Um, how have you found in Sakai community, in the Sakai community, we tried using GitHub issues and Jira at the same time. Um, we used it just for one particular project for a while. And we found it really difficult to have two um, different issue tracking systems at the same time and settled back on and consolidated back into Jira. Are you having any issues having two different systems? And, and Curious why you have two systems. Uh, we're just, I think, slowly looking at perhaps enhancing um, our use of GitHub issues, um, but we're still primarily Jira 
Now, I think that it would not be sustainable in the long run to use both, but um, there would have to be some type of a transition. We haven't done that yet. So you're basically doing like you're in doing an investigation. Um, I think because we're breaking into a number of um, separate repositories, so some of the newer components of uPortal are making more use of GitHub uh, as opposed to Jira. So it's it, we're kind of segregating it that way. Okay, well, I see it's time's up. And just as a side note, Jim, it might be interesting to compare notes uh, on how Sakai is using Jira and how you're using Jira and how you're using GitHub issues and we did and, you know, um, what the workflows are. It might be interesting to compare notes sometime. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So now we're on our fourth and final presentation for today, which is um, from Open Academic Environment. So I'm going to bring up those slides and then hand it over to Miguel to introduce himself and start his presentation. Let me get the OE slides here. All right, Miguel, let me uh, hand this over to you. So feel free to start any time that you're comfortable and we'll start timing you. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. So this presentation is about the Open Academic Environment, or OAE for short. I'm going to tell you a bit more, uh, a bit about what we've been doing lately and our plans for the future. So my name is Miguel Lajina. I'm uh, Portuguese. I'm the tech lead for uh, the OAE project, even though I'm working for uh, research, which is a stakeholder company uh, based in London. I'm currently living in Brighton as well. Um, so. Um, our main focus in OAE has been uh, mostly this, to make it easier to contribute um, regarding uh, third-party developers, uh, external contributors. Uh, and in that regard, uh, what we've done uh, is, well, all of these. Um, so obviously, updating the code base, making sure that, uh, well, the code is uh, cleaner, uh, is uh, free of code smells, and um, more modern, so to say. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, refactoring uh, regarding documentation, um, especially documentation uh, focused on newcomers, on new developers that um, just want to try out the project and uh, are, uh, well, uh, still deciding whether to contribute or not, or how easy it is to contribute. Um, so in that regard, we've also created uh, community guidelines for the project. Uh, we added a Gitter account for developers to quickly get in touch with the OAE team. Um, and well, we've been doing all of this while still keeping a very high code quality uh, metric and uh, also a really good desk, uh, desk code coverage of 90%. So in more concrete terms, what does exactly this mean? Um, so our latest work has been, um, well, we can divide it into two major tasks. The first one uh, being the dockerization of the development environment. Uh, so our goal is to make it really easy for new developers to get the project uh, up and running. So the OAE project, um, well, before, before that, uh, it was quite complex to actually to set up. I see that. All oh, right. So Sakai still has this, also has the same goal. Uh, so you know, being pro um, a fairly complex project, the OAB uh, has always been a, a bit tricky to set up. And uh, you know, when projects are difficult to uh, to set up and uh, and get to run locally, uh, it's kind of a put off for um, external developers. So we want we we wanted to fix that, and so we've been using uh, Docker to uh, uh, make it make it a lot easier for newcomers to uh, get the project going. It's mostly, uh, well, like a one-liner uh, command line, uh, command as at the moment for, um, for people to actually get the project running locally. Uh, obviously, we, uh, research also runs a commercial instance of uh, the OAE called Unity. So uh, there's also the uh, possibility of uh, uh, using the online demo to uh, showcase the features. Um, so in this second block of uh, tasks has been to update a lot of uh, legacy software, uh, clear uh, major um, technical that's 
And in that regard, uh, we've updated uh, Node to the version 6, which is still an ongoing project, but it's almost over. Um, we've updated the Cassandra and RabbitMQ drivers, which were uh, based on libraries, uh, open source libraries that were kind of obsolete and limiting. So we've uh, we've also updated that um, pretty recently. And also um, we've been updating um, lots of dependencies that had security vulnerabilities, obviously. The OE being, um, being a collaborative uh, platform for academia, uh, security is very important to us. And uh, well, that's why and we also have to uh, take care of dependencies from time to time. Um, in what comes to future work, um, there are uh, four different uh, blocks uh, or tasks. The first, the first, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the first one being uh, integrating with Stencilla. For those of you who don't know, Stencilla is um, kind of this interactive uh, editor based on um, uh, on Texture, which is another open source project. Uh, and their vision is to have an, this interactive editor for reproducible research. So they're really focused on open science and open access. But our audiences are pretty, are uh, well, they overlap uh, quite a bit. Uh, and so we're in talks with the Stencilla project uh, in order to uh, collaborate together and eventually have Stencilla as a tool to uh, integrate it uh, into OE. We also have uh, uh, some features and enhancements in, on the roadmap, especially focus on uh, providing better user experience. And then when it comes to technical debt, we also have quite a, um, a bit to do in that regard, especially the uh, uh, regarding the front end of the platform, which you, which is uh, quite old. Uh, so I would just like to welcome you and uh, invite you to um, uh, give feedback, uh, either features or fixes that you'd like to have implemented or just good practices uh, on, regarding open source that we should be following, or even just strategic ideas for the future. Just feel free to get in touch with us and because we'd love to hear, you, uh, hear your feedback. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so how much time do we have for questions now? We have four minutes for questions. So uh, uh, we got a question that says, how would you like us to get in touch? Well, no worries, uh, you did good, did good job. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, you can, well, there, there's the email right there, uh, but we also have uh, our presence on Twitter. We you could use Gitter, as I mentioned before, um, which is, well, like real, Real time chat, uh, or you know, those those would be like the best ways. I mean, probably the, the the quickest ways to get in touch. Are you guys are you guys an uh, open academic environment community aware of the recent uptake in Slack in the community? Uh, yeah, I mean, we use Slack internally. Uh, okay. The, uh, you know, within the company, but the thing with with Slack I th is that it doesn't provide a, uh, well, it's not easy for, you know, just some random developer to actually get in touch because uh, you would have to uh, register and right. you would have to authorize, blah, 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 find out the link. I think that Gitter is uh, much more straightforward. You just hmm. have to authenticate with GitHub. And, you know, as far as I know, a lot of open source projects are using Gitter. Uh, and sometimes they actually mirror uh, their, um, IRC channels to Gitter, which I think it's like more than enough. Mm, cool. Is there, do you have any sort of, um, you mentioned, so is the best way if you have feature ideas then to just write in, are there any open calls you ever have for discussion or how does that work? Um, as far as I know, we haven't, but we'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to have that because, uh, well, um, it, it's sometimes it's easy for us to uh, just focus too much on our perspectives of the, the product and uh, we might sometimes forget the user perspective. So it's invaluable to, uh, uh, to know what users are actually thinking and what they're suggesting. Uh, we haven't done anything of the sort, but uh, I think that as soon as we have uh, people um, suggesting, we will probably, uh, find some come up with some more organized way of doing that uh, but you know for now i think that uh, the google groups um uh, discussion or just email or twitter or gitter especially gitter uh, okay. should be plenty 
Yeah. Cool. I see uh, questions come in. Uh, Jim's used the hosted Aperio instance of OAE. How often does that get updated? And when you have a new release, how long until it is applied to that hosted instance? Mm, OK, so good question. Uh, it, it, it actually depends. Uh, well, we were one of our focuses has been uh, to update the code and get a more um, well uh, leaner um, and smoother experience for people to host. So uh, releases we'd like to have like uh, I don't know a release every month or something. But uh, since we're dealing with a lot of legacy code, uh, we're not respecting that that at the moment. But uh, we're uh, we're trying to be more agile in the future and uh, update more frequently. Uh, so we're looking at the moment at uh, continuous delivery um, solutions in order to uh, you know get some momentum going. Um, so okay, and now okay, and the other question is well, as soon as we get, get like a new tag, a new release, we usually uh, apply it to our to the research unity uh, instance pretty quickly. It's something that we do uh, when one after the other. So if you if you are if you're using Unity, you're using the latest version of um, OE. Yeah, it seems like probably setting up frequency to releases. Uh, Jim mentions U Portal aspires to release more frequently. Hasn't happened yet. I can say in Sakai, we've had that discussion many times about uh, sometimes trying to have like a time boxed, you know, getting a release out in a certain time frame. But it's it's really there's a lot of challenges that come up. Uh, so we're not able, you know, there's a lot of times we're not able to do that. So I think that's probably a common challenge across. Uh, across projects for various reasons. So thank you so much for your presentation, uh, everybody. I uh, see so you're, you're going to get there. <laughs> it's good optimism. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, are there any kind of, uh, so I guess just a final to close out, I just want to say thank you to all our presenters and all the projects. And um, well, this will be recorded and it will be posted up on the Aperio YouTube channel. And uh, this really came out of the FARM initiative, which is funding and resource model initiative, which is trying to find ways to make, uh, to help each other to get resources for the different initiatives we have on our respective projects and maybe also get some cross-pollination. So hopefully this went a little bit towards that, that uh, end in terms of the thinking and I appreciate everyone's uh, participation. So I think we'll sign off now and, and thank you all. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.